hello to everybody that um, is, is uh, logged on. Um, let me do a quick introduction before we get started. My name is uh, Frank, Frank Hogenrath, um, and uh, I have the pleasure to, uh, to introduce Dr. Nickerson. Um, so, first of all, I think um, it's always uh, really nice to, uh, to work with customers that, um, that help us on multiple fronts. And uh, Dr. Nickerson has been helping us on, uh, on uh, multiple fronts in that area. I think the core part of the, uh, of the um, corporation has always been about testing and thinking about new ideas uh, and testing uh, a lot of the new developments that we introduced over the last, let's say, two, three years uh, when it came down to uh, neuroimaging. And of course, um, uh, Dr. Nickerson has helped us already in fuel strength articles. Uh, he did a, a very nice presentation for us at ASNR and, uh, and other shows, actually. Um, uh, but we want to make sure that everybody can hear these uh, these presentations. So um, it is very nice that uh, he's really must be willing to uh, do a presentation in this uh, webinar. A uh, little note on Dr. Nickerson. Dr. Nickerson, indeed, as you can see on the slide, is uh, from the University uh, of Vermont, Burlington, USA. A very nice area, I must say, uh, as I've been able to to visit the place. Um, and. The focus, I think, when it came with uh, Dr. Nickerson is really about uh, the clinical use, the applicability, and the diagnosis. And I think that is what you will see in this presentation. Um, presentation will be about a couple of topics. Again, I'm not uh, going to uh, introduce that part. Um, uh, what is really nice, uh, as we learned again, this, uh, the earlier version uh, of the presentation is the, the details to look at and uh, the applicability of the different technologies. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank Dr. Nickerson to, uh, to uh, help us uh, uh, do this uh, webinar. Make sure you ask questions, and I think it is, uh, it is even nicer if we can have the questions and the right points in time, so uh, uh, Dr. Nickerson can answer these uh, as, as, as good as he can uh, uh, while he is uh, presenting the different topics. So, Dr. Nickerson, the floor is yours. Um, please um, get started with uh, the webinar. So yeah, thank you uh, for those of you who are joining us. Good morning or good evening or, or wherever you are. It's, it's evening here. It's getting actually a little bit past my bedtime, uh, but that's, uh, that's okay. I think it'll be a, a hopefully a useful session for you. So as Frank said, um, I'm a, a neuroradiologist here at the University of Vermont. Just to give you a little background, we are a, a tertiary referral center in New England, and we're about a 600-bed hospital. We run uh, five magnets here. Uh, four of which are Philips magnets, and we have been partners with Philips for over a decade uh, as a show site. So we've worked with the, the folks over there for, for many years and with our MRI research center. But uh, the focus of tonight's talk uh, in these cases is primarily clinical. So I'm, I'm primarily a clinical neuroradiologist. I do some teaching here with our residents, uh, but most of the cases that I'm going to show you tonight are actual clinical cases that came across our work list and we were able to use the tools provided to us with these uh, advanced techniques to solve clinical questions. And so those are the cases I tried to focus on tonight. Um, as Frank said, I can see the chat bar over here on the left side of the screen. And so if you have a question about an image or a technique um, or anything to do with implementation, I think this is uh, a more interactive and sort of more entertaining uh, hour for all of us if we can answer those in real time. So I'll try to keep my eye on the comments down there, and if, if you have a question, please do stop me, and I'll, I'll try to answer them as best I can. And let's see. So uh, I'm the division chief for neuroradiology. We have uh, seven neuroradiologists here at the University of Vermont, uh, five diagnostic neuroradiologists and two neurointerventionalists, and we do uh, dedicated just uh, neuroradiology. So uh, we're spoiled. It's a great place to work. Um, and as I said, these are all going to be clinical cases Primarily 3T, although there are a few 1.5 images, but I will show you for a couple of examples. Um, these are the different techniques we're going to go through and some clinical examples of each. Some of these I'm really very passionate about. I think they're really um, strong advances in the neuroimaging field, and I think they're things that all of us should consider implementing uh, in one form or another. I think they have really good impact for our patients, but uh, let's get to those in, this, in the form of specific uh, clinical cases. I think that's how this is sort of most interesting to present. So without further ado, let's start with our first patient. 
Uh, this was a patient presented to us uh, a few months back. A 40-year-old male came in with some left eye blurring and some right leg weakness, and I happened to be reading that day. And the patient was still on the scanner, and for whatever reason, the technologist called and asked me to take a look at the images before they got off. I think they were worried that he might have to come back for additional imaging. And these are some of the conventional sequences you're used to looking at. So we have a flare on the left, an axial T1 in the center, and a diffusion-weighted image. And I'll tell you that even later when we go back and see what the abnormality is in this patient, these images are retrospectively normal. Uh, there's really nothing to be seen here. But let's take a look at the SWI sequence. So let's see if I can get the pointer to work. Yep. So the SWI imaging, the SWIP imaging, was acquired. And it was the last sequence I was looking at. I thought, ah, oh, this is looking negative. The patient does, have, does not have any acute stroke on the diffusion-weighted imaging and probably going to be fine. But something caught my eye on the SWI image, and it's, and it's this right here. So these are these deep perimedullary veins in the white matter, the frontal and parietal uh, lobes. And they're just a little asymmetric. Actually, they're more than a little asymmetric. You can see just the hint of the veins over here. These are quite asymmetric. And if we look up a little bit higher uh, in the uh, frontal lobe and in the parietal lobe, you can also get a sense that maybe the cortical veins on this side, if you wheel your chair back a few feet, are a little more prominent than, than maybe they are in the contralateral hemisphere. And so you know, SWI was originally developed to look at veins. It was originally an MR venography technique. And then we figured out that not only does the SWI uh, accentuate the uh, susceptibility artifact properties of deoxyhemoglobin, but also things like hemosiderin or, or anything that disrupts the local field. And so the application was spread to a lot of things. But this is a great example of how the venography origins of SWI uh, still can play a useful role. So I knew that at the time that you can see sometimes uh, increased v uh, vasodilation in the setting of things like complicated migraines. And I thought, well, maybe this patient, since they're still on the table, maybe we can get a sense that maybe they're having a complex migraine and they're having some neurologic symptoms. And so I asked the technologists to go ahead. He was going to get contrast anyway. And we did a perfusion scan. Here is what the perfusion scan showed. So not quite what I was expecting. Uh, on the left, you have the relative CBV map. That's pretty symmetric, no big focal deficits. But in the center, you have the mean transit time. And you can see the orange being an elevated time that all throughout the carotid territory on that side, you have marked elevation in the mean transit time. So rather than this, what we might expect to see in the setting of a migraine where you just have vasodilation, here we actually have slower flow. And that clued us into perhaps there was a problem more proximal in the blood flow. And we asked the patient then to go on and get a CT angiogram. And I think uh, you can see here, if I bring my arrow back, as we follow up the internal carotid artery on the affected side, it makes it up to the skull base, and then it sort of papers to nothing. And so this is an example of a dissection. And this dissection was really not evident on any of the uh, conventional sequences other than the SWI, only by seeing that compensatory vasodilation and the increase in the caliber of those veins throughout the affected hemisphere were we clued into this finding. Even down at the skull base, looking for slow flow in the distal carotid, other things that we look for in the setting of dissection. In this patient, they didn't show up. It was just the SWI that made the case. So this patient went on to get uh, treatment and re did really well. So for those of you who aren't looking at a lot, uh, aren't used to looking at SWI images, um, sometimes people find them a little noisy. Uh, there was a bit of a transition with my colleagues when we switched over to doing entirely SWI imaging, but that is what we do at our center. We really don't do any uh, GRE imaging anymore. And the argument that I make in the case is, you know, this sequence was designed for a very specific purpose in venography initially, but now looking for blood products. I mean, that's really the bread and butter of what we do with SWI. And so I grant you that the ability to make out the underlying structures, the deep gray nuclei, the gray-white differentiation, even the ventricles compared to a T1 or a T2 is maybe not as good as you'd expect, but we have other sequences for that. Uh, this is a patient with a very typical finding of someone with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So here you can see out in the periphery of the brain these very discrete foci in some cases, rounded foci of susceptibility artifact out in the periphery of the brain, a few here out in the temporal lobe uh, bilaterally, a few out in the occipital lobes. These probably would not show up with gradient imaging, or at best one or two of them might. The initial studies in SWI um, 
we're looking primarily in the setting of diffuse axonal injury or in the setting of non-accidental trauma, looking for shearing injuries. And the uh, literature is quite clear that this is significantly more sensitive. So uh, this helps make the diagnosis in this patient. Seeing all those perfectly located foci of hemosiderin uh, really can narrow us down to say this is likely uh, amyloid angiopathy. Here's what a normal exam looks like. It takes about three minutes. Um, you do have to get used to seeing the veins. As I mentioned, this is designed for venography. So we do see these linear foci of susceptibility artifact when we do SWI. But as you scroll through a few of the images, you can see that they're linear, that they're not uh, one discrete focus, but they can be followed over multiple slices. And you get quite used to uh, figuring out that it's a vein and not a focus of hemosiderin that you're looking at. They're 3D, uh, very thin one millimeter slices. I like to read them off the source images. There are folks out there who prefer to look at MIPS, uh, which I think are great for looking at the veins. Personally, I find it easier to look at the source data to try to see those really tiny discrete foci of hemosiderin. Initially, when SWI kind of hit the big time, we had a lot of trouble with susceptibility artifact down around the skull base, whether that was over the petrous ridges uh, or near the frontal sinuses, where any place where there was dense bone or air close to the interface with the brain. But the SWIP sequence that's now available really has uh, made a lot of progress in that area. This is a nice example of that. So this used to be an area here frontally where we had a lot of trouble. You would often see a lot of artifact and you would obscure the detail within the adjacent frontal lobes. But uh, this newer technique, as you can see, there's very, very little artifact, even though the frontal sinuses are underlying that region very closely in this patient. Let's take a look at another example. Uh, this is an 85-year-old fellow who came in recently with some vertigo. And on the conventional flare imaging and the diffusion imaging, you can see, you know, he does have a few little white matter areas of T2 hyperintensity on the flare image in the temporal lobe here. But he's 85. Um, for those of you who are in the US, uh, most of our 85-year-olds, after eating an American diet, they have lots of white matter spots. And so really, this is no surprise for us to see. The diffusion imaging is entirely normal. Uh, but just like in our other case, when we get to the SWI image, something was catching the eye. And I'm actually going to scroll through a few of these images slowly and take a look at what you see in the temporal lobe. And this is what led to the diagnosis in this patient. So I'll try to go a little slowly. Sometimes this can be a little choppy, depending on how your feed is. But you get a sense that there's some asymmetry in that temporal lobe. When you look adjacent to the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, you can see some linear areas as I scroll through a few of the images. And additionally, you can see some more punctate discrete foci out in the periphery of the temporal lobe. Another more uh, focal area there in the, adjacent to the insula. So what we were worried about here was vascular congestion, some foci of hemorrhage. And what would give you that in a very non-vascular distribution? Well, certainly a fistula was top of our concern. And so again, this patient was still on the table. And we asked them to acquire a time of flight MRA without contrast. And here you can very clearly see, I think, this uh, abnormal uh, flow-related signal throughout these veins uh, adjacent to the temporal lobe. And this is a classic look for an AB fistula. A prominent draining vein is seen, and uh, the patient went on to get a conventional angiogram, and the fistula was demonstrated and treated, and his symptoms resolved. Again, this is a nice example of an entity that we would not have necessarily found if it weren't for that susceptibility weighted sequence. Just a few little flare foci is not, or would not have been likely to trigger uh, doing an MRA, but seeing those prominent veins, seeing those unusually clumped foci of susceptibility artifact and hemosiderin suggested that there may be an underlying vascular malformation in the region. Just a couple examples of conventional GRE versus SWIP imaging. So these are the same patient acquired at the same time in the magnet uh, and acquired at the same levels. And I think here you can get a sense that where there are larger foci of susceptibility artifact with hemosiderin, yes, we definitely do see that on gradient. But that's the only one we see on the gradient image in this patient. And that could be anything. You can call it a cavernous malformation. You might think it was the results of old trauma. But on the susceptibility weighted imaging in this patient, you start to see other foci out in the periphery of the brain. One here, one here, maybe one here, although that might be a vein. We go down a little further in this patient. And the gradient imaging at this level is basically normal. We don't see any foci of abnormality. But when we look at the SWI sequence here, again, we see a small focus in the frontal lobe, small focus adjacent to the uh, posterior body of the lateral ventricle. And so this is another patient where, with just the gradient imaging, we're left with one focus, very nonspecific. 
But in this patient now, we have multiple foci out in the periphery of the brain, and we start to think about things like amyloid again. If you find small hemorrhages in the basal ganglia or in the thalamus or in the pons, you might start to think about hypertension in a patient who might otherwise have no findings uh, on the gradient imaging. So we have entirely switched over to doing SWI. I'm convinced that it is, uh, it's the way to go. I will say that as a referral center, we uh, often get patients transferred to our hospital to the neurology and the neurosurgery services and they have become uh, so accustomed to seeing this sequence and having it to rely on to exclude things like amyloid or small focuses of previous hemorrhage, that if a patient comes in from an outside facility without an SWI sequence, it's really quite common that they will repeat the imaging in our facility, uh, specifically because they feel like this is sort of now standard of care. So um, I do think it's really important. So the next topic I want to talk about is nerve view, 3D nerve view. Uh, this is something that when I was a fellow, I mentioned this morning, um, my, uh, one of my teachers was uh, Dave Usum, the, the eminent neuroradiologist, and he uh, gave us the lecture as fellows about brachial plexus imaging, and he, he walked into our morning conference the day that we were going to talk about brachial plexus, and he announced to the group that really brachial plexus imaging is extremely easy uh, once you get the hang of it, you, and it should not be intimidating, and we all kind of thought, well, maybe it is for you, Dr. Houston, but most of us find it extremely intimidating. And, and after that, I think for years, whenever a brachial plexus study would pop up onto our list, we would all sort of scurry to get coffee or hide because nobody likes reading these. They're very difficult. Um, they are fraught with technical issues as far as having to uh, get good fat saturation, trying to see the nerves amongst the, va the vessels in the region. Often these patients are post-trauma. And they may have muscular injuries, they may have hematoma in the region. And uh, so there's a lot of technical reasons why they're challenging to read. This is a 21-year-old woman, came in with some right upper extremity paralysis after a motorcycle accident with the typical story of you know, arm extended and, and uh, tore the nerve roots. And this is what we see with the nerve view. So I will draw your attention to the homogeneity of fat saturation, which is probably the key uh, in these images that usually makes looking at the brachial plexus so difficult. But here you can see some markedly abnormal thickened uh, brachial plexus nerves. They're T2 hyper intense. Up here you see the pseudomeningocele where the nerve has been evulsed. And you can see that also nicely on the axial imaging, uh, displacing the fecal sac a little bit. If we uh, look at a few more images on this patient, you can see out into the periphery of the, uh, even way out into the axilla and into the upper arm, we're now able to follow these nerves all the way out, see them very clearly. Uh, see where the level of injury is. And maybe more impressively, we can see the nerves on the other side. So certainly this one might even be able to be seen with conventional brachial plexus imaging, but sometimes the lesions are not so obvious. But in this case, we're able to show the normal side following the nerves all the way out with that nice homogeneous fat suppression. Here's a picture, uh, an image in the sagittal plane, and you see the blood suppression. Right? Here's the artery accompanying the neurovascular bundle. The blood is suppressed, and so all we're left with is this bright uh, T2 hyperintensity associated with these thickened abnormal nerves as they extend out to the shoulder. So obviously, the fat suppression improves visualization. Um, the vascular suppression improves visualization. It takes about under five minutes to do this sequence. Here's another example of seeing the nerve roots extending all the way out into the axilla. Let me scroll through an image. Oh, first, here's a MIP image if you like to look at these. Personally, um, I don't find these as useful on an individual patient basis, but the neurologists do like them, uh, being able to show all the nerves at one time uh, of the brachial plexus extending out. This patient has some sort of prominent lymph nodes. They've had a dissection on, uh, lymph node dissection on the other side of their neck. So you pick up other things that are a little bit bright. Let me scroll through an example of what these look like when you're looking at them at the workstation. Uh, again, I'll try to go slowly so it doesn't crash anybody's workstation. But these are very thin. Um, you're able to pick out individual nerve roots. You can see we're starting to get into some of the nerves out here in the axilla on this side. As we move through the images, now you're starting to get some of the more proximal nerves. And look at how well those stand out adjacent to the, to the muscles they're following, to the scalene muscles. Normally, those are very difficult to separate out.
but uh, having the really strong fat suppression here and the strong T2 weighting that allows us to really pick out those nerves really makes it easy to follow each one of them as they enter, uh, exit the spinal canal. Certainly, this has made reading brachial plexus imaging much less onerous. Uh, it's no longer a task that we all flee from when they pop up in the reading room, uh, but rather one that really is not that difficult uh, anymore. Any questions about the uh, brachial plexus imaging? As I said, it takes about five minutes. Um, the blood suppression and the fat suppression are really what are key to making it uh, quite easy to see these nerves. Uh, the next topic I want to discuss is arterial spin labeling, which is a form of non-gadolinium enhanced perfusion. Uh, here's a couple of clinical examples. So the first one we'll talk about is a 21-year-old woman. Uh, a few years previous to this scan, she had had a melanoma removed. And unfortunately, at the time of surgery, they knew that there were positive margins, but she was lost to follow up. She kind of uh, refused to come back to the hospital, refused to get treatment, and was not seen again for a couple of years until she presented with some focal neurologic signs. And then very sadly, uh, this was the next study that we saw on her. So you can clearly see there's a large mass in the frontal lobe on the left. It's very heterogeneous. Uh, on the T1-weighted imaging, you see some areas of T1 shortening. Uh, in, the, uh, in the periphery of the mass here. On the uh, flare imaging, you can see uh, there's a hemorrhage with a blood fluid level, a hematocrit level in this portion of the mass here. Fair bit of surrounding vasogenic edema extending into the white matter of the frontal and parietal lobes. And uh, on the diffusion weighted imaging, you can see some areas of bright signal. I'm not showing you the ADC map, but I'll tell you that those areas were dark, so we assume that there's some areas of dense cellularity in this, uh, in this tumor. And the question is, you know, where is the viable tumor? The surgeons wanted to know where to biopsy this patient. Obviously, there's a lot of heterogeneity. It's hard to figure out uh, where to go in this case. Well, usually we would rely on gadolinium, try to find the areas that are enhancing. Unfortunately, in this patient, uh, she also refused to have gadolinium. She refused to have an IV which obviously does not portend well for her potential therapy. But uh, we thought, do we have any way to look at this question? And the answer is we do. This is the arterial spin labeled perfusion map. So I'll talk in a few moments about how arterial spin labeling works. But uh, it's a way to do perfusion imaging without any gadolinium. And what you get is a quantitative uh, cerebral blood flow map. So we don't get CBV. We don't necessarily get MTT or, or uh, time to peak, but what we do get is, is a flow map. And so here you can see that there is elevated blood flow in the medial aspects of this mass, a little bit posteriorly and a little bit anteriorly. And so this does help to figure out where is the viable tumor and where might be the best place to do the biopsy. Uh, quantitative, yes, yeah, so Frank is asking me, can I comment on the use of quantitative numbers? Yeah, so as I said this morning, one of my physicist friends here, who is, is certainly more of an expert than I am on the, on the math behind this, uh, he's English, so maths is what he says. But in any case, uh, he is, always likes me to, likes me to say that um, the quantitative value we get from CBF is, does require a few assumptions um, about the patient. But I do envision a time where this will become extremely concrete. And one of the critiques of the traditional um, perfusion imaging that we do with gadolinium, uh, whether that's DSC perfusion or DCE perfusion, is that it tends to be rather semi-quantitative. But with CBF, we actually are able to get a really good estimate of blood flow in milliliters per 100 grams of tissue. And uh, that, that's pretty impressive. We're not quite there yet, but I do hope that someday we will be to the point where in real time we can actually put an ROI on an image impacts on a CBF map. And just like we do with CT, where we look at Hounsfield units, we will be able to get a number. Say, so, you know, in this region, the average CBF is 50 milliliters of uh, blood flow per minute per, per 100 grams of tissue. I think that really is the future of where ASL is going to be helpful. So here's another example. This is a, certainly not a diagnostic dilemma. This was a patient who did get uh, gadolinium. But I just like this case because it shows you that the uh, the perfusion maps that we're able to generate with ASL, which is the image uh, to the far right here, really closely mirror what you might expect to see uh, on another type of perfusion imaging. So here we have our flare sequence. 
here we have a nasty looking post gadolinium image with all this irregular nodular enhancement and typical necrosis of a glioblastoma, bright signal in the diffusion imaging. And we see, as we might expect, a periphery of elevated cerebral blood flow uh, in the areas where there's a lot of enhancing tumor in this case. So it certainly uh, is a nice example to show that it does conform to what you might expect in a patient who did get gadolinium. One of the big advantages here is that this can be repeated as necessary. So if you have, particularly in pediatrics, uh, a patient who you don't want to give gadolinium to, or more importantly, who moves during the examination, if you're reliant on gadolinium for your perfusion imaging, you really only get one shot at it unless you're going to bring them back and re-image. The fact that you can do this without any kind of contrast and repeat as needed if the patient moves or has to get up or whatever the case might be, that means that you can repeat this as many times as you need without any concerns for toxicity. So uh, just a little, a little diagram of how ASL works. Um, this is our test patient, and he should have a good brain, one would hope. And what we do to do ASL is we first define what part of the brain do we want to image. You can do whole brain imaging. We typically don't shoot for entire whole brain coverage because we're more interested in temporal resolution. But we pick our imaging plane. The next thing we do is pick a labeling plane. And that is where we're going to actually label the spins as they're flowing through the arteries before they perfuse the brain. Where you choose to have your labeling plane in relation to your imaging plane is defined by the transit delay. And that's going to vary a little bit depending on your patient. If the patient has a stenosis in their carotid, or if they have heart failure, or any other number of things that may change the transit time between the carotids and the brain, you have to try to figure that out between pa in an individual patient. The beauty is you can do that, because if you get it wrong, you can simply repeat the study. There's no gadolinium that's been given, and, and you are free to do that. So as the blood flows, and I was very proud of this animation, you have to forgive me. Uh, the blood gets labeled as it passes through the imaging plane, and then it perfuses the brain. One thing that we figured out early on in the course of doing arterial spin labeling is it's important to uh, null the signal from the spins that are still in the arteries that are not perfusing the tissue. So obviously, if you think about putting a region of interest around an area that might contain a prominent MCA branch, you're going to have a lot of signal from blood flow that it's actually going to end up going to different tissue. So what you do is you apply a crusher gradient, which nullifies the signal from the flowing blood that's still in the arteries, and you're left just with the signal uh, from the protons that have actually perfused out into the tissue. You do lose signal when you do that. It does de you know, increase the level of noise, but it's much, much more accurate as far as just trying to figure out what's actually happening in your specific region of interest. So it takes about four minutes. Uh, as I said, you can get full whole brain coverage, and you do get those quantitative CBF maps, which I think quantitation uh, is really one of the big waves of the future in neuroimaging. It's great for, pe for pediatric patients, great for patients who can't get alenium due to uh, renal insufficiency. And this is where I will deviate just a touch and talk about research. So one of the things that uh, I'm really passionate about is, is functional MRI. And I think for those of you who have done a fair bit of it, you know that there are some frustrations around both clinical and research applications in bold fMRI. It's very difficult to quantitate bold changes. It has resulted in all these metrics like laterality indices, et cetera. Um, and I think that there may be a better way to do it. And so using ASL here uh, on our research uh, magnet, which is an Achieva 3T, uh, a resident and I a few years ago did a functional MRI study where rather than using the bold technique, we actually used uh, the ASL perfusion maps. And that's what you have up here. So we did typical protocols. We had finger tapping. That's what I'm showing uh, you up here. If I grab my arrow, this is a finger tapping map. And this was using ASL instead of bold. So the patient was in the scanner, tapped his fingers for a while, and we measured the perfusion. And what we were able to do is show that this can be done quantitatively, unlike bold imaging. We were able to show that you can specifically say, when this person taps his fingers, blood flow in the hand motor area goes up 50%. It is about 50%, and that's what we published in this case. Uh, I think that it's usually not a diagnostic dilemma to figure out somebody doing finger tapping or maybe a really easy language paradigm. But if you think about how this could impact research applications as far as functional MRI goes, all of a sudden the ability to quantitate smaller changes in blood flow bring into play the ability to quantitate neuropsychiatric tasks, emotional tasks, uh, there's really a lot of doors that could be opened by this quantitative technique. So I promised I wouldn't spend too much time in research. 
but I'll get off my soapbox now. So this was a 70, a 67 year old woman came in with some new onset of lower extremity weakness. Uh, and here we have the conventional sagittal T2 and T1 post gadolinium spine imaging. I think that uh, for those of you who look at a fair number of these, this is again, not a diagnostic dilemma necessarily. We have lots of abnormal T2 hyperintensity in the distal spinal cord. And on the post gadolinium imaging, we have lots of abnormal vessels in the subarachnoid space within the fecal sac. And so this is a pretty typical look of a, uh, an AV fistula in the spine. Uh, but for those of you who do spinal angiography, you know that these can be really difficult cases to localize. Uh, doing a spinal angiogram involves dropping the catheter down multiple levels and checking all of those lumbar arteries and trying to find the one that has the fistula. It's a high radiation procedure. It can take a really long time. And sometimes those can be really hard to slip your catheters into. So if we could find a way to localize in a patient like this who has this diffuse abnormality, what level should you start at? Maybe we can't be specific, but we can say, you know, where should you maybe start? And if we could do that uh, with the MRI, that could save a lot of time in the angiography suite. So this is what we get with 4D track imaging. It's a single injection of gadolinium. I'm going to scroll through a few of these images and show you how we use them in this patient's case. So here we start to see the bolus of gadolinium showing up in the aorta. Now we see those lumbar arteries. Right here we start to see something abnormal. So right here we now are seeing the presence of this vessel showing up in the expected region of the fecal sac and it's extending upwards. And we should not see that yet in our arterial phase. As we go through a few more of the images, you can see now it's extending all the way up into the cervical spine region. A little bit further, we can still see that as we start to get out of the arterial phase uh, we see, again, this prominent graining vein. Go back through that. So here, everything's looking pretty good. And here we see now that abnormal vein. And we can tell that this is around T11 when we go back and localize exactly what level this starts to show up at. So it's not quite as pretty when we look at it in an axial plane, but we can do that. And the fact that we're acquiring multiple dynamics means we can reconstruct axials at any dynamic time point we're interested in. So it turns out that that slice where we start to see that vessel showing up is dynamic number seven. We pick that temporal window and we can reconstruct the entire spine from dynamic number seven through the axial images. And I admit that unless you're scrolling through all these, they're hot, it's tough to see, but this is actually that fistula, this little area right here. We didn't see that uh, at the other levels and it starts to show up here in that axial dynamic number seven. And so I'm able to take this image to my neurointerventionalist, say, I think you should start at T11. And indeed, uh, that's what happened. They took this patient to angio. There was a fistula there. They were able to easily treat the patient, and the symptoms dramatically improved. Any questions about 4D track? It's not something we do on every patient, but it's really nice to have at your disposal when one of these patients comes in and you want to save on radiation time and, and save your neurointerventionalist some hassles. So zoom diffusion is a high resolution, small field of view diffusion image. Uh, this is a clinical example from our institution. 61 year old woman uh, came in after TPA at an outside hospital. And on the left, you see the conventional diffusion imaging and there's a stroke in the thalamus. We see here that's pretty clear. But look at the difference in the delineation of the anatomy in this relatively complex part of the brain uh, on the zoom diffusion image. You can see this bright diffusion signal abnormality involving parts of the, of the lateral thalamus. There are a lot of nuclei within the thalamus. It's quite a relay center. And so for our neurologists to see exactly what portions of the brain are involved is helpful. I do have a couple of cases here that are not from UVM, um, but these are this case is from Germany. Uh, we haven't had a lot of cases of zoom diffusion come through at our institution yet, but I did want to show you some of the best ways it's been used. So the, the uh, case that we're all waiting to have come through is this. This is the transient global amnesia pattern. So for those of you who've seen this entity, these patients come in with global amnesia. They have no idea of who they are, how they got there, um, and it is acute in onset, and it tends to go away, hence the transient part of the name, in a couple of days. And uh, it has been described very clearly that these patients will show up with these small foci of diffusion restriction involving the hippocampus, which actually will resolve as their symptoms resolve. And this small field of view imaging is ideal for looking for those little tiny foci. Here you can get a sense in the coronal image that you can even see what portion of the hippocampal gyrus is involved by this small focus of diffusion restriction in this patient. 
takes uh, anywhere between four and five minutes to do. These are both examples from a 3T system. Uh, here is an example from another 3T in a normal patient, but I just want you to be able to see the exquisite anatomy that you're able to see with this diffusion imaging. And this is starting to look more like what we see with flare or T2 in the temporal lobes, being able to see that uh, whole seahorse gyrus there, the hippocampal gyrus in the medial temporal lobe, uh, curving around on a diffusion image. I think, again, you can see that really nicely on the contralateral side as well. That's really remarkable resolution uh, for diffusion imaging. Uh, here's another patient that had a clinical uh, problem. These are some examples from 1.5 Tesla. So on the whole brain diffusion imaging, you see there's a little bright signal here adjacent to the aqueduct. Uh, that's an area that's often prone to artifact. We sometimes will see diffusion abnormalities near the midline around the aqueduct, and we're left wondering, are they real? Are they secondary to pulsation? But I think by using the small field of view here, uh, in this patient with an oculomotor and nerve palsy, which fits with a midbrain prob problem, you can see that there is, in fact, an infarct here. And you can see the corresponding decreased intensity on the ADC map. So that allows you to be more confident that you're not dealing with artifact, but rather this is a an actual infarct in this case from Switzerland. Uh, this is a patient, 11 years old. Uh, she has a Chiari. She's had her prior Chiari decompression. She has a syrinx in her thoracic cord, and she gets imaged every couple of years to take a look at that syrinx, make sure everything is doing fine. Uh, she doesn't do very well with holding still, so she typically ends up getting anesthesia, and to image the entire spine with anesthesia can take well over an hour of scan time, and certainly more than that of time in the room. Uh, and these are, I think, a way that we may get away from that. So these are 3D acquisitions. These are both uh, sagittal T1 and sagittal T2 images acquired only in the sagittal plane, and that's the extent of the exam in this patient. We didn't acquire any axial images. We're able to do that because we can do these really fantastic axial reconstructions from those 3D sequences, which eliminates the need to do multiple acquisitions in the axial plane. Because it's 3D, you can angle them any way you want. And this gives us a great look at the syrinx in this patient. I think you can very easily measure this, be very confident that it hasn't changed since the prior study. You get a nice look at the signal in the surrounding cord. You can even see the adjacent nerve roots. I'll show you another example of that in just a few minutes. But there's a substantial time savings here. And in an 11-year-old, this actually is getting us to the point where we don't need anesthesia. Uh, we're able to do these patients much faster, and a lot of patients are able to get through. Here's another example uh, of a seven-year-old. This is a patient who has medulloblastoma. And as you know, these patients get imaged frequently looking for new metastatic disease in the fecal sac. I'm going to actually scroll through the source images here so that you can get a sense for uh, how useful this can be. These are the T1 post images, the 3Ds. And uh, here, also there. As we scroll through. You can start to see, we get into the fecal sac here, you start to see the nerve roots coming down from the uh, level of the conus. And as we get towards the midline image, right about here, I think you can very clearly see this is the distal fecal sac, and uh, there's nothing there. There are no drop mets, there's no abnormal enhancement along the, uh, along the conus, along the, uh, the arachnoid here. And so I feel like I can be very confident with these 3D images that there are no new metastases. Um, they're much thinner, uh, and I think they're very sensitive to the presence of abnormal enhancement. You can see the fat saturation is beautiful here, um, but this is a, you know, a young, small patient, so uh, we get really nice imaging with this, with, uh, with this sequence as we come through all the way uh, to, the, uh, to the other side. You can very clearly see those nerve roots of the cauda equina coming down, really nice visualization. If there was something there enhancing along those, uh, we would see them really well. And I feel more confident now reading these as 3Ds than I did with the 2Ds, including the axial acquisition. So I think it's a win-win uh, for everyone. So what's the big deal? That patient was done in 20 minutes. Um, you're talking about just sagittal acquisitions and then uh, axial reformats. Uh, you can get them in any plane you want. You can oblique them. You can uh, get them parallel to the disc if you want. It certainly reduces anesthesia time in patients that need anesthesia. In a lot of cases, we're able to avoid anesthesia, and there's certainly a lot of push to do that. There are a lot of literature coming out now that maybe in the developing brain, multiple exposures to anesthetic agents is not the best thing. Uh, and then from a practical perspective, you can increase your throughput. You can reduce the slots you have to allocate to these patients. And the patients are happy. They don't have to spend as long lying in the magnet. 
Uh, so it's really a win-win for everyone. These are our actual protocol numbers. This is literally what we started with and what we do now as far as how long it takes us to image these patients. And as you can see, it hovers around a 40% time savings by doing these 3D, uh, 3D acquisitions. So what I think is sort of the next thing, and uh, I'm pushing, uh, always pushing Frank on this a little bit, is I really think that what we should be doing is trying to push this technology out to adults. Um, obviously, we don't do a lot of pediatric spine. Nobody does unless you're at a children's hospital. You know, we have these patients one or two a week where we might do a total spine. But we do a ton of adult lumbar spines and cervical spines. Every day we're doing you know, 20, 30 of these exams. If you could find a way to apply this to adults and no longer have to acquire axial imaging, now you're talking about significant time savings for a big percentage of the patients you have coming through your department. And I think it works. I think we're there. I think this sequence is, is able to do that. When you look at these axial reconstructions, I am perfectly comfortable reading this. I, I feel like I have better look at the nerve roots than I did with the, uh, with the old sequence. And there are small discs, small things hanging out in the subarticular regions, very easy to see with these 3D reconstructions. And this is not some idealized patient. This is more of your standard American patient. They're pretty good sized. Uh, they've got a lot of degenerative disc disease, and yet uh, we're able to really nicely uh, reconstruct these images into axial views. I see a question coming through. Question on reading. Where do you use the MPR tools? So with the 3Ds, uh, because these are isotropically acquired, we can, uh, we can reconstruct these in any plane to relative to the disc. So if we just do a straight axial reconstruction, this patient has a pretty straight spine, but in patients who have an exaggerated lordosis, we can actually uh, reconstruct them in planes that are uh, parallel to the disc space, and that, that is helpful for using uh, the MPR tools that are available. Or certainly we can even do obliques uh, in the cervical spine. Our neurosurgeons, for years, we, uh, we've acquired uh, cervical oblique images through the neural foramina. So that actually means we're usually acquiring two additional sequences in the cervical spine uh, when we do our conventional imaging. If we do 3Ds, and we're working on this right now to really get it optimized, uh, we don't have to acquire those anymore either. We can simply reconstruct in those oblique planes uh, and not have to, and we can save another 10 minutes there on, on every cervical spine that we do. So the ability to do MPRs uh, and reformatted images is really huge in 3D. Uh, this is something that we're doing in patients to look at our ability to do motion correction. As you know, a lot of patients end up coming back and getting repeated studies for motion, particularly younger patients or patients that may have a tremor. Um, and this is an example of, of one of those patients. This is before we did multivein. This is our traditional T2 imaging, and you can see this. There's a fair bit of artifact here. In both of these images, you see these arcs uh, throughout the, uh, the brain on both sides. Let me show you what this looks like with multivein. Same patient, uh, acquired the same time in the magnet, and all of those are gone. I can promise you he was still moving. He had an essential tremor, was unable to hold his head still, uh, but with multivein, we're able to completely eliminate that artifact. Excuse me. So I think this has a lot of potential applications as well in pediatrics or in patients who are unable to hold still, uh, trying to find ways to eliminate the need to repeat sequences. Uh, it decreases motion artifact, um, certainly reduces CSO pulsatility. That's one of the things we see very clearly with using multivein uh, and means that we have to repeat those less often. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can certainly see the, uh, the art article there on the net forum. And uh, I should mention at this point that we are going to post um, these exam cards uh, to net forum. And if you have any questions about how we do these or how we optimize these images, that's a good place to start. So those are all of the cases I had to show you. So I really enjoyed working with them, and I think it has benefited our patients greatly. They uh, feel like they're getting the highest level of care. They're just getting state-of-the-art technology applied to their, to their medical care. So that's resulted in a really high satisfaction. We've had great communication over the years between ourselves and, and Phillips on the technical side, uh, great technical support, and um, it's been a really wonderful partnership. So my email address is there. Uh, I think this is being recorded. If you want to go back, if you come up with any questions you'd like to ask me about implementing, implementing any of these sequences or any of our experiences uh, with Philips and these advanced MR modalities, I'd be happy to, to take those questions. And we have a few minutes left. If anybody has any questions, so you're welcome to type them into the chat bar, and I'll do my best to answer them now.
well, at least thanks for me, uh, Dr. Nickerson. Um, yeah, as Dr. Nickerson said, please, please uh, make sure that um, if you have any questions, ask now or, or, or email. Um, in the meantime, thanks again for, uh, for, for helping out with this webinar on this late hour. Um, this is the, uh, the second webinar here. So, uh, for those uh, running with Philips, you can actually we will actually record this so that uh, there's an additional possibility to review later on. Um, I have no further questions. I want to thank you, uh, and uh, I'm sure we will talk uh, further later on. Uh, I actually will go to bed. Also, want to thank Stefan for uh, organizing everything. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Nickerson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the webcam. Actually, it makes it um, uh, more alive again. It's, it's, it's <laughs> very nice. It's very hot in my office, so I feel particularly alive at the moment. But uh, Okay, okay. All right. All right. And I did hear like an ambulance coming by or something. Uh, yeah, was... they're right outside the door. I did get a question. All right. The 3D spine images acquired with Dixon, um, they can be. Uh, it's not, we, we have done that, it gives you better fat sat, obviously a more homogene, homogeneous signal, uh, but that is not, I don't believe, inherent to the sequence, but uh, certainly combining the best of both worlds will give you the best, the best picture. All right, well, thank all you right. all very much, and uh, I think I'll head to bed myself. Have a great day. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Innovation and you, Philips.